So today we are going to cover not one, not two, not three, but 60, no, sorry, 89 verses of scripture. So put your seatbelt on. We are going to be in 1 Kings and we're going to cover chapters 6 and 7 today. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff to unpack. But um, I'd like to first by just giving y'all a recap of what's been going on. So David was king and God had blessed him in different ways. But David wanted to build the temple for God. And God says, no, you can't do that. You're not allowed. There's too much blood on your hands. But I will build, I will have your son build the, the temple for me. So Solomon, which is David's son, is now king. He's on the throne. And David is now passed away. And uh, God is very pleased with Solomon. Uh, when he talked to Solomon and he asked Solomon what he wanted, Solomon said, I want wisdom. Give me wisdom. And God said, you know what? Because you were so good in that, you didn't ask for the death of your enemies. You didn't ask for great riches. And you didn't ask for these things. He said, what I'm going to do is I will give you wisdom, but I'm going to also bless you in these areas. I'll give you riches. I will, uh, I will allow your kingdom to be so big that no other king will be like you. But then he also gave him a condition. If, if you walk in my ways and you keep my statutes and my commands, just as your father David did, I will give you a long life. So in this, he says, hey, look, I'm going to give you these things, but, so it's the if, if and then statement that takes place. It's going to take place a couple of other times in the scripture as we go through, but just be aware that there's an if and a then when it comes to this. So Solomon was to build the temple. It was promised that God would allow him to, to build the temple and that he would plant the children of Israel. Uh, it says that the son will build the house and God will establish the kingdom forever. And then his son Solomon messed up. In fact, God even tells David earlier, said, when your son messes up, I'm going to discipline him, but I'm not going to leave him. Okay. When he messes up, because God knows everything. I don't know if y'all figured that out yet. God knows everything. He knows everything we've done, everything we're doing, and everything we're going to do. So God says, hey, when he messes up, know that I'm not going to leave him, but I am going to discipline him. So this is where we are at the start of this story. Uh, we're going to get to the part where we're building the temple. And this is also in the Old Testament. For those that don't know, the Old Testament, um, Jesus has not come yet. But God has chosen to dwell with his people a few times during the Old Testament. Now, God's everywhere. And he, he could be anywhere and everywhere. And he is anywhere and everywhere at all times. But he chose at certain times to dwell with the people. You can think first was in the Garden. In the Garden of Eden, he dwelt with Adam and Eve. He walked with them, physically walked with them through the Garden. There was that. And during that time, there was nothing between them, nothing that was between them. They were in complete union and great. They could be face to face. And then sin took place and there was a separation. And then there's a second time that God dwelled with the people, and that was in the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was God's presence on earth. The Ark of the Covenant was there. It was a tent. It was specific. There was all these great measurements and how big it was and how far it spanned and what it was made out of. And, but... It was a tent, and basically they moved it everywhere they went as they were leaving Egypt and they were in the wilderness making their rounds. They were moving around and God was with them, but they didn't have a permanent place yet. They get into the promised land and now God is going to establish a permanent place. He's going to plant his people. This is the promise that they've been waiting for, that God would plant them in the land. So the third time is the temple, and that's where we're at right now. This is where God was going to meet with his people, and the temple was very important. First of all, it was important because God said build it, and it was specific in how it was built. And you'll see in just a little bit the details that took place in building the temple and what it was made of, but God is a God of order, and he is, he is a, a God of design, and he, he made this specifically. He wanted his people to build it in a specific way. It was also to unify the people. See, just prior to this, you, we read that David, that Solomon and David and them were sacrificing in high places, okay? This was a place for everybody to come together, sacrifice and worship the Lord. It's a place that unifies them. There's no longer sacrifice that's taking place in other places. It would also be built to bring God glory. This is built on a hill. It's for everybody to see. And when people came by through Jerusalem, they look and they could see the temple. It brings glory to God. 
where they're worshiping, how they're gathering brings glory to God. The Ark of the Covenant is there. This establishes a permanent place in the land. You know, for those that are in the military, y'all know what this like. You know, every two or three years, they move y'all to some other base somewhere. You're just in the wind. For those that have been football coaches or worked in the oil field, you know how that is. You never have a permanent home. You just have a home for right now, and you're kind of wandering around. But that feeling you get when you get to put down roots and you go, this is our home. This is what Israel's been waiting for. They've been waiting for a permanent residence, a place that's going to be uh, set out specifically for them, a grounding that takes place. So here we are. Now we're caught up. It's time to build the temple. See, Solomon has now the work permit. And if any of y'all try to get a work permit at any time to build something, you know that this has been an ordeal. Solomon has, they've been wandering through the wilderness. They've been waiting for David. Now Saul's here, Solomon's here and they has a work permit in hand. And now the work is going to begin. Solomon first, just uh, prior to this, he starts getting his labor force together. He, uh, he drafts a bunch of people, 30,000 men are sent into different areas to cut the wood, to cut the stones, and to prepare for the building of the temple. So in chapter 6 and 7, there's the structure of the temple. If you'll look in there, it's, there's a lot of detail, and we're not going to go verse by verse because we'll be here. It took seven years to build the temple. If we go by verse by verse, we'll be at least seven hours in. So to spare you all that and to love you all, we're going we're gonna to kind of condense some of that. There were specific met, uh, measurements for that. So many feet by so many feet by so many feet by so many feet by so many feet by... And then there was a porch with so many feet by so many feet. They called it cubits back then, and we're not talking about cubits like the, uh, the guy from Valentine's Day. It was roughly a, a foot and a half, but in our, uh, C, uh, our Christian Standard Bible, it gives us feet, so that helps a bunch. But I first like to begin by telling you it was roughly 2,700 square feet was the temple. This was going to be the dwelling place of the Lord, and it was 2,700 square feet. Now, some of y'all are thinking, golly, that's a, that's a pretty good-sized house. But if you put it in relation, you can sit 67 and a half of those in the super Walmart. Okay? There's a, there's a lot of... It's, it's really small in comparison to what we have built now. But this right here was specifically designed by the Lord to be built in a specific way. And in the ancient... Uh, world, this was a wonder to be seen. This was something that was huge and audacious and great, right? Um, so it was roughly 2,700 square feet. The stones, if you look, were cut outside of where the temple was. They were, they were cut off site and they were brought in, but they were cut in such a way that it was so perfect that they fit together exactly how they should. It says that they didn't even use tools in the temple while they were putting these together. Now, for those that have done any construction, you, you measure twice, you cut once, then you cut three more times, then you go back to the lumber store, you get some more wood, then you come back and you measure a third time and then you use a lot of putty to fix those mess ups, right? But here's the deal, God is so specific that they were able to cut those stones and they were skilled in such a way they were able to cut those stones and bring them and fashion them there without having to use tools. That's an, that's an amazing thing in itself. If you look too, there's, there's two 15-foot cherubims that are there. There's, there's uh, these beautiful, fancy bifold doors is what they talk about too. And, and then all of this is covered in wood. So if any of y'all thought the 70s and 80s were the first of the paneling, you're wrong. This started way back in the temple. Everything was covered with wood. We're praying that it's 3,000 years from now before we go to paneling in our houses again, just so you know. There's nothing like having to take lemon pledge and some liquid gold and rub down the, the walls so your house looks shiny and clean, right? But here's the deal. He goes and they go to Lebanon and they cut these fancy, this, this really expensive fancy wood and they line everything inside the temple with wood. And then they line it with pure gold. They didn't spare any expense. The best stones, the best wood, the best gold for the Lord. Inside that, there was the Holy of Holies. It was a special place where the Ark of the Covenant would rest. And it was 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. It was a cube. And it was the same thing. It was decorated with gold and with wood. With wood, then with gold. It was completely shiny. And in it, there was, in, in the whole temple, there was all sorts of carvings that, that were there. There was oxen, and there were lions, and cherubims, and wreaths, and palms, and lilies, and pomegranates, and gourds, and open flowers, 
Now, all of this was a throwback to the garden where God had dwelt with the people before. When they walked in there, they could see these things and it reminded them that God is with them, that God was with them in the garden and God's with them now. It's a place where God's going to dwell and it was done well. The Holy of Holies was a place that only the, the high priest could go in once a year and, and make atonement or, or make a sacrifice on behalf of all the sins. He was able to go in the presence of the Lord, him and only him, right? There was a veil that would prevent anybody else from even seeing in there after it was completed. But then you look right after that, we rip into to, uh, chapter 7. We talk, start talking about Solomon's temple. I mean, Solomon's, um, his palace. And it was even greater. You know, it talks about all the things. And multiple times it talks about the costly stones that were there. It talks about the wood and the wood beams. It took seven years to build the temple. It took 13 years to build Solomon's palace and all the effort that took place to make that happen. And he spared no expense. In fact, not only did he build his house, he built one for Pharaoh's daughter while he was at it. And then we shift right back into uh, the furnishings of the temple. So we go from how the temple's built to how Solomon's palace is built. Then towards the end of seven, we, we start going into the, uh, how the furnishings were inside the temple. And the reason why all this is here, you go, golly, that's a lot of detail. And it is because God is a God of detail. God is a God of order, right? It's written in here, not so we just glance over it, but for us to understand the importance of, we know, we know the importance of instruction, right? If you've ever tried to put an IKEA desk together, you know it's important to follow the instructions, right? If not, there's consequences for those actions. You, you have to lean the desk against the wall to keep it from falling down. But God has a God of order and he has a plan and he has instructions in our lives. The expensive stuff that was, in, that was used to make the temple and make the furnishings of the temple were cedar and juniper and cypress and costly stones and olive wood. And it talks about pure gold. This isn't just regular gold, it's pure gold. It's, it's not mixed with anything, it's pure. And then there was a guy named Hiram. And there's a brief clip about who Hiram is. He is a skilled craftsman. He's skilled in bronze work. He does awesome work. In fact, they basically import him in here to do this work. And in that, he makes several different things. But two of those are these great pillars that are in front of the temple. They're made of bronze and they're huge. They're 27 feet high and they're 18 feet in circumference. And, and to get circumference, you two pi, two pi r equals circumference. Anyway, you two pies, and then you, by the rate of how you eat them, and that gives you circumference, right? So um, anyway, it's, they're huge to be said. They're these great, huge bronze pillars that are in front of the temple, one on either side. And on top of that are these, they call them capitals, but basically a crown that goes on top of these great big, they're 35 feet in the air. Now, I bring that to your attention because Hiram was so skilled that he, he sculpted pomegranates and lilies and stuff on the side of these capitals that are 35 feet in the air. He's highly skilled in what he does. There's none to compare how he is. But the thing I'd like to point out in Jamie, when I was talking, Jamie in the sound booth, we were talking about, you know, this stuff that's going on. And he made a point that he had heard about how God gives you skills, God gives you talents that you may use and people may see, but then he may give you, he has given you skills and talents that the world may never see and they may never, never appreciate. You think in the ancient world, 35 feet in the air, a pomegranate's carved into the top of this capital on top of this pillar, 35. So think of the roof here. Could you see the detail of a pomegranate at the very top of the roof? The only people, the only person the only being that would be there to be able to see that and to enjoy it would be the Lord. God may have, and God has equipped you with some skill, some talent that some may see and some may never see, but they all glorify him. He can look down at who you are and how he's created you and he can enjoy what he's made. Anyway, that's a sidebar. Let's get back to where we were at. All of this being said, he made, he made a great big huge basin that, hold, that held 11,000 gallons of water. He made 12 basins that held 220. Anyway, it's just on and on and on about what's been created. And I would encourage you to read through that because it shouldn't be wasted. Um, but let's get to the heart of what these two chapters are. 
the heart of the chapters, as it comes from both sides, is right here in chapter 6 and verse 11. And it's going to be 11 through 13. Chapter 6, verse 11, it said, The word of the Lord came to Solomon. As for the temple you are building, he's right in the middle of building the temple, and God says, hey, wait a minute. I want you to remember this. Pay attention, quick. Right in the middle of it, I'm going to interrupt you. He says, the word of the Lord came to Solomon. As for the temple you are building, you are to walk in my statutes, observe my ordinances, and keep all my commands by walking in them. I will fulfill my promise to you, which I made to your father David. And here's the promise. I will dwell among the Israelites and not abandon my people Israel. If then, if you do these things, I will keep my promise that this is what I'm going to do. If then. It's important. God's desire is obedience. Right? The temple was a place for them to worship, a place to go to. But in the middle of them building this great place, it's going to shine glory to him. He says, but wait, listen, I want you to be obedient. See, here's the rest of the story. Right after this, the temple's built, his palace is built, Solomon takes on a bunch of women, and that leads to destruction. It really does. But while he's walking faithful, being obedient, and holding to the statutes, God is right there with him and blessing him in all these different ways. But the rest of the story is Solomon fails. He fails to keep his end of the deal. He neglected to keep the ordinance and the statutes and he neglected to obey God. His many wives took him away to a point of idolatry. At this, as soon as Solomon dies, and I'm sure we're going to get into that, but the kingdom is divided into two. Instead of being one kingdom, it gets divided and from there, it continually gets worse. In fact, there's, there's a playlist of this one was good, this one was bad, this one was bad, this one was bad, this one was bad, this one may have been good, that one's bad, and then this one, they're all bad. But the kingdom divides, and they, they turn their back from God, and it leads to complete destruction. In fact, it leads a destruction to the temple. The temple gets sacked, and it gets destroyed. It only lasts 400 years. This temple that Solomon built only lasts about 400 years, and then it's completely destroyed. They get, they get removed from the promised land and they go to where the Babylons are. The Assyrians attack, the Babylons attack, and they become slaves of these other countries because they failed to keep the statutes to be obedient to what God's called them to do. There's a warning there. Your obedience may be for you, and it is for you, but your obedience may also be for others. See, not everybody in Israel had turned their back on God, but the leadership had, right? And it led to a place of destruction for a lot of them. So your obedience is a benefit to you, and it's a benefit to others. Solomon's sin resulted in exile, and there were consequences for obedience, disobedience. So there was the garden, then there was the tabernacle, then there was the temple, then what was next? I'm glad you asked. Jesus arrives. Jesus is here. Emmanuel, God is with us. This is the time that God chose to dwell with man again. He walked with him hand in hand. God was here on earth. Jesus was the fulfillment of the temple. He came to live with us. He was the perfect once and all sacrifice that was there, right? He brought glory to his father, exactly what the temple was, to bring glory to his father. It was a place for sacrifice. Jesus was the sacrifice to pay for our sins. Just as the Holy of Holies was a place where the, the high priest would bring them in and make it bring in a sacrifice to God to pay for the penalties, to atone in exchange for the sins that we've committed. Now Jesus is that. In fact, at one point Jesus said when he cleans out the temple, the second temple, when he cleans it out, they start saying, who are you? And he goes, destroy this temple and I will raise it up three days later. Jesus is talking about he's the temple. He's the temple that will be destroyed and then three days will raise from the dead. When Jesus was crucified, the veil was torn that separated the Holy of Holies. When it was torn, it gave us access to God directly. We didn't have to go through a priest. We don't have to go make a sacrifice a place. Jesus was the once and all sacrifice. So in this, we have audience direct with the Lord. God is everywhere, but now we can boldly approach him. After Jesus' resurrection, he ascended into heaven. 
So then, if Jesus was the temple here and He's resurrected, then what's next for us? I'll tell you, as believers, we are the temple. Where does God dwell now? He dwells in us as believers. In, in 2 Corinthians 6, it says, For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch any unclean things and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So we are the temple now. Those are the believers. The Holy Spirit resides in us. The Comforter came and he lives within us. And, you know, that may be foreign to some of y'all, but those that believe know that God is in us. Amen. And just like there was a purpose of the temple, it was to, to meet with God and it was to bring glory to God and it was to unify the people. It was to establish a permanence. We, in the same way, are called to do the same. We fall under that same warning and to be obedient. Keep my statutes. See, you yourselves, a, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer sex, sex, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are being formed together. So as you go about your way, God is chipping off parts of you that are not fitting in the temple. So when you struggle with whatever that sin is, and you can name all of them, and well, we probably can't name all of them because we'll be here all day. But as, as God is chipping away those, He is forming you to be part of something that is going to continue to bring Him glory. If you're struggling with anger, and God chips that away to where He changes you to be more like Him, the rest of the people will see that change in you because you were obedient that they will, it will bring glory to the Father. So David and Solomon both had a warning to remain obedient. Also in 1 Peter we get, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but to the one who called you as holy. You are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Believers, we are called to be his temple. We are the stones that he's chiseled away to bring God glory. Live righteously. Here's the other part. Live righteously. Here's the then, because there's consequences. There's physical consequences here on earth. There's not spiritual consequences if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Our eternity is secure, but there are physical consequences on whether you're obedient. <coughs> And those consequences may not just be for you, they may be for those around you too. So be obedient. Hold the statutes. You may think, golly, what are your statutes? What are the statutes? What am, what am I failing at? You probably know, right? As believers, the Holy Spirit is groaning and letting you know what you're struggling with and what you need to continue to fight. If you don't know, be praying. God, reveal what those are because none of us are perfect. Uh, Max says it all the time. I wholeheartedly agree. Every one of us is messed up. No one here is better than anybody else, right? I don't think he says it just exactly like that, but you're messed up. I'm messed up. Let's get on with it, right? <laughs> so let's be obedient, right? For those that are believers, I encourage you now, get right with the Lord. Live a life that's faithful. Live a life that's obedient uh, because there are consequences, right? Here's the deal. Not just for the consequences, to show your love for the Lord and what he's done for us. His sacrifice is not in vain. Now, for those that are lost, the veil was torn. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have access to the throne now. Amen. You can come to him now and accept him. There are consequences for you too in being rebellious and not being obedient. There are consequences and those are eternal consequences. And to tell you straightforward, that consequence is hell. Without choosing him, that consequence is hell. The veil is torn, you can come to him. Just like there was the destruction of the temple that took place, every one of us, our bodies will eventually be destroyed unless we're still alive when Jesus comes back. So there's a high probability that your body will be destroyed one day. Whether that's ravished and destroyed by old age and illness, 
are hit by a train, right? I can say that because there's all the other trigger things that would cause some serious emotion. And I don't want to stir your emotions, but I want to warn you ahead of time that the day is coming. The destruction will be coming. And when that time comes, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it will be too late. You will face the God Almighty, but you will face Him in judgment, not in mercy. For those that are believers, praise the Lord that you will face the Creator of the world with mercy. For those that are lost, I would love to talk to you about it. I would love to help convince you of what God is already calling you to do. If you stumbled in here today, it's not by accident. You're here on purpose, right? Just like God purposely fashioned the temple, just like God has purposely fashioned us together to bring Him glory, He has called you here to hear this message.